But you came out and people said, boy, this is great. It's not as bad as we thought it was in losses. And then some analysts said, uh, we're a little shaky on the fourth quarter. Give us your perspective on what's coming up. Yeah, look, the, the, both the third and the fourth quarter were dramatically impacted by the Delta variant. And while bookings bottomed out and were clearly on the road to recovery now, a lot of the fourth quarter was impacted and business offices that were going to open in September have been pushed that that's been pushed back to January. And so really, you know, regardless of what the fourth quarter is, I think the story, at least for long term investors, is about 2022 and beyond. And on that front, we're really optimistic um, and all the signs are positive um, and point to a good direction for for 2022, both on the cost front, uh, but also on the demand and revenue front as we as we look to the future. So how much visibility do you have into the fourth quarter and then going Going to 2022, which is what you said you really want to pay attention to, in terms of bookings, and I'll break it down more specifically, uh, leisure uh, as opposed to business. Yeah, so we already see very strong leisure demand here in the United States, and it's again roared back to, to record levels. Our expectation as we look particularly at the holidays are that the holidays are going to be really strong. Normally in the fourth quarter, there's a lot of business traffic. It's much more business traffic dependent outside of the holidays. Uh, and business traffic has rebounded to the levels it was pre-Delta variant, uh, but it's not to the levels we originally expected. But everything we hear and see from our corporate customers and our accounts and those people that are traveling is that we should expect more people in offices and a big inflection point in business demand come January. We haven't really seen the data yet because booking business bookings is typically happen a lot closer in. Uh, but everything we hear, all the anecdotes we hear and see would indicate that there's going to be an inflection point post-holidays and that business demand, in addition to leisure demand, is going to start to come back in a much more material way. You mentioned the extent to which your third quarter, even fourth quarter, affected by the Delta variant. Uh, as we all get back on airlines, whether domestically or internationally, is it going to look different? I know that you've been talking about a premium economy. Is it possible that for the long run, we're actually going to change some the configurations because we might not want to sit quite as close to one another? Well, you know, certainly at United, the configurations are changing as part of our United Next, our 500 aircraft order. We're reconfiguring all of our airplanes, significant increase in the number of premium seats on airplanes. But what is going to matter more, I think, is the change in the customer experience. I mean, we've seen a huge improvement in our net promoter scores uh, as we went through the pandemic, and that's continuing as we come out of it. So I think what customers are going to notice more is really the change in the not just the product, but in the customer experience and how they feel when they fly United Airlines, how our employees treat them. There's an immense amount of pride at United Airlines for what we did, uh, deserved pride for those employees, what they did to get us through the pandemic and the product, and they're proud of it. Um, and that is leading to much better customer service. Uh, you mentioned uh, 2022. Uh, as we look into 2022, my understanding is that you're going to be bringing more capacity online internationally, but not so yeah. much domestically. If that's correct, why is that? Won't there be a big uptick in domestic travel as well? Well, I think if you look backwards, you saw a pretty big increase in domestic travel. It's clearly outperformed international. But as we look forward to the summer and beyond, I think the international market is going to actually be stronger, particularly to Europe. Middle East and Africa, places that we've added during the pandemic. And the supply demand balance is different. There have been hundreds of wide body, long haul international aircrafts that have been retired around the world. Uh, and that means that the supply demand balance is, is much more imbalanced internationally. So we expect next summer to be the strongest by a wide margin summer that we've ever had uh, across the Atlantic. And if you look forward, uh, it really looks different now that the borders are down and consumers, customers, business travelers, everyone is allowed to travel back and forth to Europe. I know, Scott, that you've been really focused on costs and keeping costs down, getting costs down. You've used, in some ways, the pandemic to make some structural changes. One cost I think it might be hard to control is jet fuel prices, which really yeah. are spiking up. Give us a sense of where you think we are on that. Is there anything you can do about it? Well, jet fuel prices in the short term impact our, our p and uh, But over the medium to long term, typically our natural hedge to jet fuel prices is the revenue line and demand, meaning that the reason jet fuel prices go up, and that's the, and the reason they're going up right now, is because economies around the world are strong. And when economies around the world are strong, there's a lot more travel on our airplanes. And in the short term, the Delta variant has had a bigger impact on aviation and on travel. Um, and so that link has been a little bit broken. But by the time we get into the middle of next year, I would expect that link to have reestablished itself and the strong economy to support our revenue line um, and counteract the increase, increase in fuel prices. Does that process that you described, does that lead to pricing power? That is to say, what is the prospect that you can pass some or all of these increased fuel prices along to passengers through increased fares? 
Well, that's exactly what happens. You know, when your cost of producing a, an airplane seat goes up, uh, airfares have to go up. And that's just Econ 101. And that is what happens. That's what we've always seen historically. The reverse happens too as well. Uh, when air, when uh, fuel prices go down, airfares typically go down as well. Uh, but that's such a big component of the cost of travel uh, that it typically winds up in the price of tickets that, that customers all, all either pay, either when it's going up or when it's coming down. Uh, Scott, you've taken a pretty uh, emphatic stance when it comes to vaccinations of your employees, just requiring them to be vaccinated. Others have either not gone that far or if they have, they've had to back off of it some. What's been the effect on United, positive and negative? Have you lost some valuable employees? On the other hand, do you think some people are more likely to fly United because they know that? So we got 99.7% of our employees vaccinated, um, you know, in less than eight weeks. It proves that it can be done if you just if you don't backtrack, if you're not wishy-washy about it, um, if you communicate openly and honestly with employees, um, and, and I think it's one of the best things we've ever did, done for the culture at United Airlines as well. Um, you know, our people are really proud uh, of the fact that we were willing to lead um, at a time when no one required us to. You know, we didn't try to blame this on the administration or anyone else. We said it's the right thing to do for safety. We always put safety number one. It's the right thing to do for safety. And that's 100% of the reason we did it. And, and that has really led to a cultural moment at United. I mean, I, every time I walk through airports, I have dozens of employees stop me to tell me how proud they are of United. And, and that I think matters in, in, for the obvious reasons, but that also is what really changes the customer service culture because those employees that are proud of United want all of our customers to feel the same way. And they go above and beyond to take care of customers and do all the little things that make the difference. And that it's going to wind up being a transformational cultural uh, event for United Airlines. Uh, Scott, finally, that's the employees. What about the passengers? Uh, we hear, read, see instances of so-called air rage because we all have to wear masks, whether we're like it or not, vaccinated or not vaccinated, we have to wear masks when we fly on your aircraft. Uh, we see those instances, but sometimes with the media, it's hard to know how representative it is. Is that a broad-based problem? Is it much more anecdotal? What's your experience? So uh, this is another one where the experience at United Airlines is, is different than what you read about on uh, some of our competitors. And in particular, just like we were the first to require vaccines, we were the first to require masks. And in April of last year, we worked with our flight attendants union. We knew that would be a potential big controversial issue. No one was requiring it at that time. And so we worked out procedures to help with de-escalation on the airplane. And in particular, what we do is our flight attendants have a card that they give to a customer that, that's being recalcitrant about a mask. And that card simply says, last warning, you're going to be banned if you don't put your mask back on. And we've had to ban 700 customers. But because of that and because of their professionalism, we avoid the incidents in the sky uh, for the most part that you've seen on other airlines. Um, and things are civil. And you know, our presidents have just done an amazing job during this pandemic. And it's another one of those that the experience on United is different than at least what I read about happening at other airlines.